This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. With over 900 different moves, choosing which four to teach your Pokemon is incredibly important. And knowing when to change a Pokemon's moveset throughout the playthrough is a valuable skill for any aspiring Pokemon master. But what if a Pokemon could only ever use the first four moves it learns and then that's it? I tried a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum to find out. In a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, and I can only catch the first Pokemon I find per route. After a Pokemon's four move slots have been filled up, any additional level up moves are banned. TMs are banned. HMs are required for progressing through the game, but can't be used in battle. The rest of the rules for this playthrough are shown here and in the description down below. Going into this playthrough, I really have no idea if it's even possible. So come along and let's find out together. That was so cheesy, why did I say that? The first thing to do is pick my starter, but since we're stuck with the first four moves in their moveset, none of them are gonna be sticking around for too long. I go with Turtwig since Absorb and Razor Leaf make him the best answer into Rourke's rock types. Plus, he's reasonably bulky, and Razor Leaf is honestly not that terrible, especially compared to Bubble and Ember. With John on the team, I start rounding up the standard early game encounters that come more or less guaranteed in any Platinum Nuzlocke. Most of them will have pretty terrible movesets at this low of a level, and will really be most useful for guaranteeing future encounters on later routes thanks to the Species Clause. However, Sansa the Starly does no Wing Attack, and Jamie the Shinx knows Spark, which are both fairly decent no drawback stab moves, especially for Gen 4 standards. Rourke is our first challenge, but his feeble-minded Pokemon are simply no match for the absorptive powers of John the Turtwig. I make sure to switch to Razor Leaf for Kranidos, and just like that, Rourke bends the knee and we've won the very first gym badge of the challenge. So now I can head to the Pokemart and purchase some repels. As we get to higher levels, repel manipulating will be important for ensuring that Pokemon have the best possible moveset. For example, Onyx learns Rock Throw at level 9. By using Repels and leading with my own Pokemon at level 9, I can ensure that the Onyx I find in Orber Mine, which after Species Clause is a guaranteed encounter, will know Rock Throw instead of Tackle. Unfortunately, after spending all my hard-earned cash on Repels, it's not enough to goad out the low encounter rate level 9 Onyx. So I decide to cut my losses and settle for a lame level 7 Onyx, but the only problem is that this turd refuses to be caught. Against all odds, ball after ball, this phallic asshat remains completely impervious to the powers of Dr. One Ball HG. 11 balls later, and I'm at a loss for words. Never in my life have I failed to catch a Pokemon with a single ball. And now, this barely sentient string of pebbles has done me in? I don't deserve to hold the mantle of Dr. One Ball HG. I'm a fraud, a fake, a charlatan. I regret to inform you, but we have our very first death of the run. The man known as Dr. One Ball HG is dead, and he's never coming back. Onyx, I hate you. You are irrevocably and without a doubt the worst. Well, with an identity crisis instead of an onyx, we make our way to Floroma Town. There, I can head to the honey tree where my encounter is a Cherubi. And after whittling her down with John, I catch her with a single ball. Haha, <laughs> Dr. One Ball HG is back baby. I was pretty worried that Mars would be a bit of a challenge without an Onyx to sit there and soak up hits from her Perugly, but it turns out that a bit of Intimidate cycling from Jamie and Sansa are enough for Shay the Geodude to slowly whittle her down with Tackle. And just to be clear, I taught Shay Rock Smash so that we could progress through the game, but she's not allowed to use it in battle. Anywho, a few turns later, Shay has tackled Mars's fat cat to death, and victory is ours. On Route 205, I catch a level 11 Shellos named Gendry, who has one of the better movesets we'll see in this challenge. Water Pulse and Mud Bomb give him excellent dual stab coverage, so he'll be a useful asset throughout the playthrough. As will Adard the Drifloon. His moveset isn't much to brag about, but triple immunity will be useful for pivoting. Cheryl murders the Baneri that would have been my Eterna Forest encounter, so the next stop is the fight against the second gym leader Gardenia, though unfortunately for her, we have quite a few counters to her grass types. Adard is able to easily gust his way through Turtwig and Cherum, and then Catelyn the Golbat comes in to take care of Roserade. She doesn't know wing attacks, so unfortunately we have to use Bite instead. 
As a result, it's actually Sansa who comes in and takes the kill with a needlessly cruel critical hit wing attack, winning us the second gym badge. So far, this has been a pretty easy challenge, but as we advance further into the game and enemy Pokemon start having stronger movesets, things will become exponentially harder. Jupiter's Skun Tank is handled by the same strategy as Mars's Perugly. By playing around critical hits, we're able to safely win the battle without any risks to my team. On Route 206, I catch a Machop named Gregor, and on Route 208, I catch a Roselia named Marjorie. The former gives me a moderately reliable fighting type move in Karate Chop, and the latter has a shockingly phenomenal move set of Leech Seed, Magical Leaf, and Mega Drain. Neither play a role in our battle against Fantina, though, who with her Ace Miss Magius provides the run's first major challenge. We don't have an easy way to take her out, so this could get ugly. Fantina leads with Duskull, and I lead with Catlin. A few bites are enough to quickly take out the Little Wisp, immediately bringing in Miss Magius, who threatens with Psybeam. But this lets me fairly comfortably switch to Samwell the Bibarel, though he does lose more than half of his HP to a critical hit. That's fine though, because his unique normal water typing baits Miss Magius into going for Magical Leaf, which grants me a safe switch into Lysa the Cherum. And since she's at nearly full HP, she can easily tank a Shadow Ball and hit Miss Magius with a Leech Seed, effectively signing her second death certificate. Because now I can just switch between Lysa and Samwell as Leech Seed gets to work. Unless she feels whimsical and clicks Confuse Ray, Miss Magius will always go for Shadow Ball on Lysa, which Samwell is immune to, and Magical Leaf on Samwell, which Lysa resists and therefore gets back enough HP from Leech Seed to not be an issue. So a few minutes later, Ms. Magius falls, leaving Fantina with just her Haunter. This fella is annoying because of Hypnosis and Confuse Ray, but is otherwise innocuous since she can't hit normal types with anything other than Sucker Punch. Switching between Samwell and Sansa is enough to stall her out, and then comfortably take the KO a few turns later, winning us badge number three. As we leave Heart Home City, our rival Winter challenges us to a battle, though at this point he's weak enough that he doesn't pose much of a threat to my team, so we can just move on. But rest assured, we'll have to really deal with him soon enough. There are quite a few encounters I could get before the next gym fight, but for strategic purposes, I'm choosing to delay most of them. I do catch an unknown named Bran from the Salacian Ruins, and believe it or not, they actually will be important a bit later. Hell, some might say that Bran here will have the best story of any Pokemon in this entire playthrough. Never mind that they literally won't be in an entire season of the show, I mean an entire stretch of the game, but when it's all said and done, you'll absolutely be asking the question, who has a better story than Bran? Also, does this say that Bran happily eats anything? How? Well, I also catch an adamant huge power Meryl named Davos, which is awesome until you see his moveset, so that's a bit of a bummer. But even without the unparalleled might of physical Azumarill, our team's looking pretty strong, at least in appearance. Against Maylene, who leads with Meditite, I lead with Sansa. A single wing attack is enough for the KO, which brings in Machoke next. I switch to John, now a Torterra, on a soft rock tomb. Then we trade off attacks for a few turns, with our Razor Leafs doing far more damage than Machoke's strengths. Since Maylene oddly elects not to heal her Machoke, he goes down faster than I expected, and Lucario comes out last. I switch to Adard, now a Drift Blim, who's immune to all of Lucario's attacks, except Metal Claw. This gives me a safe switch to Jamie, now a Luxray for an Intimidate. And then by switching back to Adard and repeating this process two more times, we can lower Lucario's attack by three stages. After that, it's off to Gendry, now a Gastrodon. With Lucario's attacking power drastically reduced, our little Slurpy Swimmer is free to get the KO with two Mud Bombs, winning us the fourth Gym Badge and keeping the run completely deathless. As we head south to Pastoria City, I catch a lonely Houndor named Misende from Route 214. Terrible encounter, her moveset is horrendous, but catching her here ensures that I can catch a Girafferidge named Arya from Valor Lakefront, who will be useful a bit later. The fifth gym leader, Crasher Wake, and his water types are always deceptively challenging. Floatzel, in particular, has phenomenal coverage for this point in the game, so I do need to tread carefully. Wake leads with Gyarados, though, who's his own problem, since he outspeeds Jamie, the only potential electric-type encounter at this point in the game. 
I could catch a Pichu or a Pikachu from the trophy gardens, but at their caught level, they would straight up not know a single electric type move. My best bet is to risk Jamie to a crit flinch waterfall. I luck out as the Kingslayer avoids a crit and a flinch, which lets him take the KO with a single spark. Wagsire is second, so that's an easy switch into John on a mud shot. With the speed drop, Quag can nail us with a yawn, but then he goes down in one shot as well. So last is Floatzel, which is where things get tricky. I swap to Jamie to get off and intimidate as Floatzel hits him with an Ice Fang. An Orenberry brings him back to over 50%, but we're still at risk to a crit, so I switch to Sansa on a now baited Brine. Then it's back to Jamie for a third Intimidate on another Brine, though that one did risk the crit. So with that, I swap to Lysa on yet another Brine. From this HP, she should be bulky enough to tank even a critical hit Ice Fang, and an Asper Berry means that we can avoid a freeze and almost always be guaranteed to connect with a Leech Seed. It's a shame that the rest of her moveset is garbage, because now we just have to switch out. But with Leech Seed support, Gendry is able to comfortably take out Floatzel with a few Mud Bombs. It'd be even more comfortable if Storm Drain didn't suck in Generation 4, but regardless, Floatzel falls, and victory is ours. I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop, because so far, this challenge has been as chill as an ice cube. Like, just take a look at that huge honkin' chunk of frozen water. A picture-perfect square of frosty goodness taking up space on your screen. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their all-in-one platform and customizable templates, it's quick and painless to easily create professional and polished websites. And with their fluid engine design system featuring drag and drop technology, it's easier than ever before to fine tune every single detail of your website. For example, I use Squarespace to launch Poppy H G.com, the only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. I recently added a donation button if you want to give Poppy some treats. It's a great example of how easy it is to personalize your website with Squarespace. And they have a ton of other really useful features to get the most out of your business or hobby, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. With the ability to surf outside of battle, I can now get what is hands down one of the best encounters in the entire run. We're off to the Great Marsh, which is always just an absolute pleasure. I, I love everything about what's happening right now. Several minutes later, I make my way to a patch of water where, with the help of a few max repels and a lead Pokemon at level 37, I can guarantee a high-leveled Wooper or Quagsire. At level 37, both Wooper and Quagsire are guaranteed to know both Earthquake and Yawn, two incredibly useful level-up moves. I end up finding a Quagsire, which is a bit of a bummer since Wooper would have also known Rain Dance for some weather control and also been significantly easier to capture. But it's no problem for Dr. One Ball HG. I definitely wasn't worried here even, even a little bit. With Hodor, the Earthquake Spammer on the squad, it's time to take on Byron. Against his lead Magneton, though, I send out Gendry, who shrugs off a meaningless metal sound, and then gets an easy one-shot with Mud Bomb. That brings in Steelix, but our sluggy boy is a speed demon, and outspeeds to hit a nasty water pulse. It's not enough for a one-shot, but Steelix just goes for a Sandstorm, which effectively does nothing thing other than making the editing of this battle slightly more annoying. After a Hyper Potion, Water Pulses drown Steelix and bring in Byron's final Pokemon, Bastiodon. I'm unsure if Earthquake from Hodor is enough to guarantee a one-shot, and I don't want to get nailed by a Metal Burst, so I first go for a Yawn and then an Amnesia to ensure that the fossil is comfortably asleep. After that, we fire off an Earthquake, which actually does leave Bastiodon with a sliver, so it's a good thing I was careful. Gotta love Hodor's calm nature, but one more natural disaster later, and victory is ours.
It's around this point that I started to seriously consider whether it was possible to do this run completely deathless. We still have a lot of threats left and the Elite Four is going to be a nightmare, but for the sake of my teammates, it's worth trying, right? Unfortunately, our next challenge is Candice, who is gonna be really tricky. Her Pokemon have some very hard-hitting moves and my current teammates just aren't gonna cut it. Which means that it's time for a recruitment montage. Cue the license-free heist music. Our first stop is the southern tip of Sinnoh, Route 221, where I catch a pseudo-woodo named Varus. He actually won't be used for the fight against Candice, but is important in another fight down the road, so I have to mention him here. For narrative cohesion. Then it's off to Route 212 to catch a Curlia named Alaria. Terrible Pokemon, doesn't even know a psychic type attack. But with her checked off our encounter tables, I can head to Route 209 and catch a guaranteed Chansey named Elena. Her moveset is also trash, but she's the perfect counter into Candace's Frostlass. Then it's off to the grass outside of Fuego Ironworks. By leading with Egret the Rapidash who has Flash Fire, we can drastically increase the chances of getting a Magmar as our encounter, which... What's that? Flash fire doesn't increase the chances of encountering a fire type until generation eight. Well then, we got lucky. Because with access to Fire Punch, Tormund is ready to bring the heat to the fight against Candace. Ladies and gentlemen, the perfect team has been assembled and we're ready to rock and roll. Candace leads with Sneasel and I lead with Gregor. He has to tank a super effective aerial ace, but then a single karate chop is enough to get the KO. That immediately brings in Frostlass, notably before Obama Snow sets up Hail. So it's off to Elena, whose massive HP and special defense stat, along with access to Soft Foiled, mean that we can very comfortably stall Frostlass out of essentially all of her PP. Now, since Elena's only attacking move is Double Slap, we do have to wait for Frostlass to take herself out with Struggle, which does happen eventually, but not before she lands a critical hit Struggle that nearly kills Lady Elena all the way from full HP. Yeah, Struggle can indeed crit, but with Candace's biggest threat down for the count, we can hopefully wrap things up without any issues. I switch to Torment on a very soft avalanche. Side note, he's already taken some damage here because I got impatient stalling out Frostlass and tried to be clever, only for him to get nailed by a Shadow Ball. There's a reason that patience is one of the best skills a Nuzlocker can have. Anyways, I'm totally unpunished for it here, since Tormund can simply one-shot Snow with a Fire Punch. So last is Piloswine. I switch to Hodor on a soft stone edge. He then outspeeds to nail us with an earthquake, revealing that had we switched in on an earthquake, things would have been pretty shaky. No pun intended. Didn't even notice the pun until I was reviewing the script. We can nail Piloswine with a yawn and then swap into Gendry on another nasty earthquake. And with the little piggy asleep, we can get off a safe water pulse. This brings Piloswine into the red and also causes confusion. But unfortunately, it means that on the following turn, Candace heals with a full restore, and since a second water pulse doesn't get the KO either, I'm in a pretty tight spot. Gendry won't survive another earthquake after all of the hail chip, and neither will any of my other Pokemon. So despite doing my absolute best to prepare for this battle, it's here where the deathless journey ends. From a purely utilitarian perspective, I decide that Egret should be the one to make the sacrifice. With a moveset of Growl, Tackle, Tail Whip, and Ember, her utility has pretty much ran its course. But it doesn't make the sacrifice any easier. With tears in my eyes, I send the fiery mare to her death. Or not. Okay, well, Ember takes out Piloswine, and through what can only be described as an act of God, the run remains deathless as the seventh gym badge is ours. The next major fight is the fight against Cyrus in the Distortion World, so I pick up a few more encounters just to make sure I have as many potential team members as possible. From the peaks of Mount Coronet, I catch a nose pass named Robert. Honestly, I was hoping to get an Obama Snow here, since at this level they would know Woodhammer. Instead, I'm stuck with catching a lower leveled Snover from Route 217 named 11, who at level 35 only has Ice Shard. Anyways, I also managed to catch a female Snow Runt named Daenerys from Lake Acuity. Her moveset is purely physical, but Frostlass is still the far superior evolution option. 
Of these three newbies, only Robert is coming into the distortion world to fight Cyrus. We just simply couldn't fit the other two on the team. What with the HMs needed to navigate the distortion world, and the powerhouses needed to take on Cyrus's threats. This fight is pretty tough, so if we want to make it out of here deathless, we're gonna need some all-star performances. Cyrus leads with Houndoom, and I lead with Hodor. Things immediately swing our way, as Houndoom misses a Will-O-Wisp, letting us take the KO with an Earthquake. To be honest, I was so concerned with a potential Dark Pulse flinch that I didn't even think about Will-O-Wisp. I definitely lucked out there. The unbelievably terrifying Gyarados comes in second and kicks things off with a massive Giga Impact before Hodor can retaliate with a Yawn. With that, it's finally time for Bran the Broken to take the stage. They come in for free as Gyarados has to recharge. Then, as he falls asleep, Bran is safe to nail Gyarados with a quad-effective, choice specs boosted, hidden power electric for about 60%. Side note, do you think Unknown wears choice specs like this or like this? Let me know down in the comment section. Anyways, this is fine because surely Gyarados will stay asleep for more than one- Oh no! Oh no! Hold on, my dear child, by God, hold on! Listen to my voice, Bran, just don't let go. Never let go, buddy. Ah, <laughs> Bran lives! The beautiful bastard lives and takes out Gyarados with another hidden power. Eat an unknown D, Cyrus. I just killed your Gyarados with a motherfucking unknown. I am the world's greatest Nuzlocker. With Hunchcrow out, it's off to Robert, who unfortunately does tank a pretty nasty critical hit Night Slash on the Switch. Hunchcrow also knows Heat Wave, which does do a ton of damage to Robert, especially since one of them crits, before we can take out the bird with two rock slides. That definitely could have gone better, but what are you gonna do? Weavile is fourth, so it's off to Davos on an Ice Punch. Then I switch to Gregor on a Night Slash, which frustratingly crits again. But even more frustrating is that Weavile's follow-up Ice Punch freezes. Gregor had one job, and that was to take the KO with Karate Chop, but honestly, that's kind of on me for giving him a Citrus Berry instead of an Asper Berry. Well, now I gotta switch to Varus, but I first go to Davos on another Ice Punch. We stay in for a turn to tank a Night Slash and hit Weavile with a Tail Whip. Then it's off to Varus on another Night Slash, which thankfully doesn't crit. Neither does the next one, so Varus is able to nail Weavile with a Rock Tomb, though it sadly does not get the one shot. That means that Varus has to tank one final Ice Punch, which he barely survives, before taking the KO on the following turn. We're still deathless, but Cyrus has one last Pokemon, and our team is in real rough shape. Only Hodor is above half health, and he doesn't have a way to deal damage to Crobat, but I switch him in anyways to hopefully get off a yawn. After an Air Slash, a Citrus Berry brings him back into the yellow, so we are good for a turn or two. I'm horrified to see a Confuse Ray come out, because if Hodor hits himself in confusion, we're kinda screwed. Against all odds though, he clutches up and yawn connects. So now it's off to Robert, who despite only having 16 HP, can survive at least one Air Slash, Crobat's only attacking move other than Poison Fang. We luck out by coming in on a Toxic, so Crobat falls asleep, letting us hit him with a super effective Rock Slide for free, though my heart does drop a little when I see that it's not even a two-hit kill. Crobat stays asleep, but since a second Rock Slide brings him into the red, Cyrus heals with a full restore on the following turn. Our Rock Slide brings him back down to a little over 50%, but now things get scary. Air Slash comes out for 5 damage, but thankfully doesn't flinch, since it means we can now retaliate with a Thunder Wave. With that, we outspeed, and the first thing I do is set up Sandstorm. I'm hoping that the chip damage will make Rock Slide a 2-hit kill, but at the very least it also increases our special defense. A Lucky Paralysis means that we remain at 11 HP as we go into the next turn and connect with another Rock Slide. Probat breaks through Paralysis this turn, so Robert falls down to 8 HP, and then the Sandstorm Storm Chip just barely misses out on getting the kill. Just in case Cyrus heals again, I go for Thunder Wave. Since he doesn't, we do have to tank an Air Slash, which looks like it would have actually killed with a crit. But even so, since I didn't know if Cyrus would heal again, I do think that Thunder Wave is always the correct play there. Because had Cyrus healed again, Crobat could have easily swept the rest of my team and I'd be looking at a full-blown wipe. 
Thunder Wave was the right play to protect the entire run, even if it did risk Robert's life. But as we've already discussed, I'm the world's greatest Nuzlocker, so we're never punished, and a deathless victory over Cyrus is ours. Look, I know this wasn't my best team composition, but when I found out that Brand's hidden power type was electric, I had to use him for this fight. Would getting even slightly worse luck in this fight have caused me to wipe? Yes. But Bran the Broken took down a freaking Gyarados. That's cinema, baby. With Cyrus defeated and Giratina safely tucked away in the box, never to be seen again, it's time to face off against Volkner. And here, our strategy is quite simple. Against his lead Jolteon, I go with Hodor, who can comfortably lull the pup to sleep with Yawn. Then I switch into Arya, who can safely set up three agilities as Jolteon takes a snooze. Once we're at plus six, I use Baton Pass to bring Hodor back in, making him the fastest Quagsire in the West. Earthquakes rip through Volkner's electric types like San Francisco in 1906. Electivire goes for a cheeky critical hit quick attack before falling, and his final Pokemon Lugs Ray is actually able to survive the hit, but since Crunch only does 55 damage, Hodor is never in any real danger, and victory is ours a few turns later. Which means that it's time to set our sights on the Pokemon League, but not before getting two more important encounters. The first is a tentacool from Sunny Shore City named Picel. The second requires going to the depths of Victory Road and using Repel Manipulation to find a Gabite. Not so much as a peep, Garchomp FJ, or it's back in the cage. At this level, Khal Drogo knows Dragon Claw, which off of Garchomp's monstrous attack, will be incredibly useful against the Elite Four. But first, winter has finally come, so it's time for a showdown with our long-looming rival that is sure to be a brutal and bloody affair. He leads with Staraptor and I lead with Jamie. Thanks to the Intimidates, our Spark doesn't get the KO, letting Staraptor retreat with a U-turn and send out Snorlax. Using a daisy chain of immunities, I bring in Gregor on a crunch, though my strategic switching is made somewhat redundant by Snorlax landing a critical hit and getting the defense drop. But nevertheless, Gregor takes the KO with two Karate Chops, bringing Staraptor back in. But since Jamie paralyzed him, classic Jamie, Gregor can outspeed and take the KO with another Karate Chop. Infernape is next, but Gendry takes him out with a single Water Pulse, Roseray gets one shot by Sansa, Floatzel is one shot by Jamie, and Heracross is also one shot by Sansa after guaranteeing a safe switch with Yawn from Hodor. So with that, the battle is over and Winter has been defeated. Oh, was that a bit anticlimactic? Were you expecting Winter to be a bit more imposing when he finally arrived? Well, at least you were able to see the entire battle. At least this fight was lit by more than six haphazardly placed $3 Yankee candles. It could have been worse, believe me. Anyways, with that, all that's left to do is conquer the Elite Four, though in this challenge, that's much easier said than done. Here's my final team, all leveled up to the level cap of 59 to match Lucian's Gallade. Our squad is... decent. I did the best I could to address every different threat that the Elite Four has, but there's absolutely going to be some stressful moments. When it's all said and done, will we have beaten this playthrough completely deathless, or will this final challenge do us in? It's time to find out. Fortunately, I have really good answers to the first few members of the Elite Four. With an expert belt, Tormund is able to fire punch his way through a Aaron's bug types without breaking a sweat. Drapion's not a bug type, but also can't really do much damage to Hodor, who's able to get an easy one-shot with Earthquake. Similarly, Marjorie the Roserade is my answer to Bertha. Choice Specs Magical Leaves pack a nasty punch against all of her ground types, starting first with her lead Whiskash. Now Glysaur comes in second and only takes neutral damage from Magical Leaf, so she will live a hit and retaliate with a super effective Ice Fang or a powerful neutral Earthquake. But I came prepared for this. See, by maxing out Marjorie's defense EVs, she'll be able to survive even a critical hit from Glysaur. If she gets frozen by Ice Fang, Natural Cure can be used to remove the freeze, and then I can get a safe switch back in by yawning with Hodor. Or we can just land a critical hit, I guess. Well, Bertha's three remaining Pokemon obviously fall to a single Magical Leaf apiece, so just like that, we're halfway through the Elite Four.
The third member, Flint, is also mostly checked by a single Pokémon. Grandmaster Pycelle is fast enough and strong enough, with a choice specs of course, to one-shot his lead Houndoom with a Water Pulse. Infernape is also frail enough to be one-shot, but unfortunately Magmortar is a bit bulkier, so she pretty comfortably survives one hit. The good news is that Pycelle is bulky enough to tank a super effective Thunderbolt, so he lives to get one last kill against Magmortar with another Water Pulse. Fourth, though, is Flareon, who's deceptively bulky on the special side and way too strong on the physical side for my squishy jelly to stay in. So it's Hodor who comes in on a Will-O-Wisp. Not ideal, but it is what it is. I immediately switch to Call Drogo for his debut as Flareon launches off a resisted overheat. Then we take to the tunnels, emerging for the clean KO one turn later. Last is Rapidash, so I go for a Dragon Claw just to avoid any issues with digging if Rapidash goes for Bounce. Since he just preps for a Solar Beam, a second Dragon Claw takes the KO, and victory is ours. But here's where things get a touch sketchy. As you can see, we have no Psychic-type resistances. In fact, we have two Psychic-type weaknesses, so Lucian and his team of mostly speedy Psychic-types are gonna be a tough nut to crack. We do, however, have our secret weapon, Daenerys the Physical Frostlass. She's our lead into Lucian's Mr. Mime, and with the help of a held black glasses, she can get a clean one-shot with Crunch. Let's hope that this taste for blood doesn't result in a completely rushed and unearned villainous turn in the 11th hour. Bronzong comes out, which is Lucian's first problematic Pokémon. I switch to Tormund on a Calm Mind, which is the best case scenario, because Tormund is holding a Focus Sash. If Bronzong had attacked with Gyro Ball, a critical hit Earthquake would have been enough for the KO. But now we can safely take the KO with two Fire Punches. And even better, Bronzong gets greedy and goes for a second Calm Mind. So, as the massive bell falls a few turns later, Tormund remains at full HP with his Focus Sash intact. Gallade is third and Lucian's second problematic Pokémon. This guy has truly phenomenal type coverage, but anticipating the Stone Edge, I switch to Khal Drogo. It is a crit, but that shouldn't matter because Dragon Claw is a two-shot even after Citrus Berry recovery, and Cal is bulky enough to comfortably tank a Psycho Cut between turns. So, with Gallade down, Lucian is left with just two Pokémon, both of which are quite speedy and quite strong. The faster and stronger of the two is first, and I kinda messed up here. None of my Pokémon are faster than Alakazam, which means that I've got basically no choice but to leave Call in and hope that he can survive a Psychic. I fully acknowledge the irony of this situation, guys, let's just move past it, okay? Psychic comes out and I hold my breath. Call's HP bar ticks down and a playthrough worth of memories flash before my eyes. If Call falls here, the run is over. All I can do is pray that he's somehow strong enough to live this hit. With 7 HP in a dream, Call fires off a Dragon Claw for a clean kill over the Mustachioed Menace, salvaging our run by the slimmest of margins. Lucian is left with Espeon, but now we can switch to Hodor on a quick attack, tank a Psychic, nail him with an Earthquake, get a safe switch to Daenerys as Lucian heals, and then take the clean KO with a Crunch. And so the final member of the Elite Four has been defeated. But now we're off to Cynthia's Chambers, the place where dreams and Pokémon go to die. The lingering regrets and heartaches of past defeats make the air feel heavy. One way or another, the run ends in this very room. It'll take everything we got to win this fight, much less to do it deathless. But our will is strong and our hearts are true, so without any more delay, it's time for our date with Destiny. As the music swells, Cynthia sends out the first of her six Pokémon, Spiritomb, and I come in with my biggest gun first. Khal Drogo strikes the ghostly spirit with a Dragon Claw, just enough for a two-shot, as she retaliates with a Shadow Ball for some chip and a pesky special defense drop. A second Dragon Claw brings down Spiritomb, and Cynthia now too brings out her biggest gun. It's time for a Garchomp showdown. The perfectly IV'd level 62 run killer in one corner, and the three attack IV'd level 59 Khal Drogo in the other. But hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, and Cynthia's Garchomp has grown fat and lazy atop her throne. We've trained for this exact moment. 
Carl Drogo is exactly one speed point faster than Cynthia's Garchomp, which means he can strike first and nail the beasts with a super effective Dragon Claw. It's not enough for the one shot as Cynthia's Garchomp recovers back to over half HP with her held Citrus Berry. This means she can let a massive Dragon Rush rip, but she's not the only one with a berry. Paul's holding a well-timed Haban Berry to reduce the damage of Dragon Rush by 50%. With that, he's able to hold on in the yellow and with one final Dragon Claw on the next turn, claim the title of Sinnoh's Mightiest Drake. Third is Milotic, and in some playthroughs I might consider a sack here for a safe switch, but the dream has been to win Deathless and we're not giving up now. Pycelle comes in on a very soft Dragon Pulse before I switch again to Hodor on a Mirror Coat. Then Milotic just continues to generously spam Mirror Coat as I hit her with a Yawn, and then also an Earthquake. Thanks to Milotic's Marvel Scale ability, which buffs her defense when status, Milotic does actually survive a second Earthquake, but all that does is prolong the inevitable. Cynthia heals, and since Milotic just continues to spam Mirror Coat, we take the KO with a few more Earthquakes, and Hodor remains comfortably at full HP. That means that Roserade is fourth, so it's off to Marjorie on a quad-resisted Energy Ball, and then Daenerys on a now-baited Extra Sensory. This lets us get a clean kill with Ice Fang, and baits in Lucario fifth so I can switch back to Hodor on a soft stone edge. Then he tanks a massive Aura Sphere, and with one Earthquake, buries Cynthia's penultimate Pokemon. But if you think that it's all over, guess again, because last is Togekiss, and I've really got nothing for this guy. He has phenomenal coverage and incredible bulk, which makes trying to deal with him deathless a total nightmare, especially with most of my team already damaged. I start with a switch to Pycelle on an Air Slash that does way more damage than I was hoping, but at the very least we can nail him with a Water Pulse for… a pitiful amount of damage. But Pycelle appears to be baiting Shockwave, which gives me an idea for an out. I first switch to Torment on another Shockwave. Then I switch to Hodor on a now baited Water Pulse, activating Water Absorb. This should give him enough HP to survive an Air Slash, which means we can put the bulky pest to sleep with a Yawn. Air Slash comes out, but Hodor flinches. Buddy. Okay, I, I, I think I can give him one more shot. I switch to Torment on an Air Slash, and if we're lucky, he will once again bait Water Pulse so I can bring Hodor back in, and Water Pulse does indeed bring him back over 50%. So now, Hodor, all you gotta do is hold. Hold the door, big guy. Hold, on. hold the door. Hold on. Before you comment about Serene Grace Togekiss, Cynthia's Togekiss has Hustle, so a double flinch here is actually pretty unlikely, but yeah, that, that pretty much is my last out. Unless Togekiss manages to miss an attack, it's now officially impossible to win this challenge deathless, because Air Slash can now kill every single one of my Pokémon. The first to go is Hodor, but let's not let a bed shitting of biblical proportions in the final fight of the run distract from an entire playthrough full of truly incredible performances. We wouldn't be standing where we are without Hodor, and for that, I'm eternally thankful. Rest well, buddy. Without much thinking, I bring in Danny next, hoping to get a greedy kill with an Ice Fang, but she actually comes up short, and an Air Slash takes her out. And now, my haste may very well be my ultimate downfall. Because, as I bring Cal Drogo in, Cynthia heals with a full restore. And since Dragon Claw isn't a two-shot, without a critical hit, we're looking at another death here. The problem is that if I go for another Dragon Claw, and Cynthia heals again, I am screwed. We already saw that Pycelle does basically nothing to Togekiss, Marjorie will also do nothing with her resisted grass moves, and Torment with his relaxed laissez-faire nature will just get outsped. So I cannot click Dragon Claw here. Instead, I switch to Marjorie, who meets her end with another Air Slash. This does give me a safe switch into Pycelle, who can do some chip damage with Water Pulse to put Togekiss in range of another Dragon Claw before going down. But just as I think I have the match sealed up, Pycelle crits Togekiss, putting him back into healing range. To add insult to injury, he gets confused, but just breaks through and kills Pycelle with a shockwave anyways. This now means that if Cynthia heals here, I lose the entire run. 
everything we've been through in this playthrough comes down to whether Cynthia has more than two full restores. Information that is frankly very poorly documented across the major Pokemon databases. But at this point, there is nothing left for me to do except hope. Hope that Cynthia does not heal. So holding on to that four letter word, I click Dragon Claw. And Call Drogo takes the kill on Togekiss, meaning that against all odds, we've beaten not just Cynthia, but the entire freaking run. That was absolutely wild. What an incredibly fun and unique challenge with a truly stressful finale. I have never been more proud of a Garchomp than I was of Call Drogo. He's the rare breed of Garchomp that can say that he's been in a Flygon HG Nuzlocke and lived to tell the tale. And what a tale it was. I'm honestly surprised at how easy we had it for most of this challenge. I definitely got lucky in a few spots, but I'm kind of stunned at how little I struggled up until like the seventh gym or so. But nevertheless, it was really cool to do a challenge run that still let me use a bunch of different encounters because some of the strategies I got to come up with were really fun to use. Before closing out the video, I just want to point out that that final battle was a great example of how it's often better to intentionally sacrifice a Pokemon instead of needlessly trying to win the fight deathless, especially if it's the very last fight of the challenge. Had I just let a Pokemon or two go down earlier in that fight, I would have never been in the incredibly dangerous position of wiping to the champion. But obviously, I wanted to give myself the extra challenge since I had been deathless up until that point, and I do think that it made for a very narratively satisfying ending to the story of the run. But in general, for your own Nuzlocke's that you're not putting on YouTube, don't do that. that it, it was very risky. Just do as I say, not as I do. Anyways, as always, thank you so much for watching and for your continued support. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future ROM hack challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the best ways to directly support the channel. The links to everything are in the description down below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.